Hello and welcome to the fourth session of the Wilson China Fellowship Conference. I'm Lucas Myers, Program Coordinator with the Asia Program and Associate for Southeast Asia. There's been a slight change in the program. I'll be stepping in as moderator uh, to close out today's discussions. Today on our panel, we'll be discussing the party's interests, history, and Xi Jinping. We'll be interrogating key questions surrounding the party's changing identity, its ideology, interests, and view of history. Since Xi Jinping assumed the triad of crucial positions, the General Secretary of the CCP, Chairman of the Central Military Commission and President of the PRC, um, many commentators and analysts have noted a reassertion of the party's dominant role uh, throughout Chinese society. President Xi has abandoned previous norms surrounding collective leadership and term limits in favor of assuming more personal power. And there are few, if any, signs of a reversal in these trends as Xi gears up for what looks to be a third term in leadership. Over the past decade, these efforts have manifested um, in a variety of actions by the Chinese government to control historical memory, repaint the party's past, alter policymaking practices, and assert greater control over many facets of life in China, most notably uh, Hong Kong. So today I'm joined by uh, four Wilson China Fellows who will be analyzing various aspects of this broader topic. I'm uh, very happy to be joined by McCabe Kelleher, who is an assistant professor at Southern Methodist University, Emily Matson, an adjunct professor at William and Mary, Casey Miura, who is an assistant professor at the University of San Diego, and Joseph Terigian, assistant professor at American University. And for the audience, you may ask questions directly to the speakers via email to asia at wilsoncenter.org or via Twitter by tagging at Asia Program. And with that, we'll begin uh, with McCabe, who will be presenting on Hong Kong. Uh, great. Thank you, Lucas. Uh, thanks for stepping in. Uh, hello, everybody. The title of my report, uh, which you might see in, in the program, has been changed slightly and from the project title, which is probably what the title that you see in the program. So that you won't see in the title of my report. But the new title uh, of, my, uh, of, of my project here um, and, and kind of the kind of frame of what I'm presenting on uh, is as follows, the Hong Kong political economy and the crisis of democracy. So given the policy element of the report, I thought this title better captured its essence. Well, but allow me, allow me to explain. Let me situate this. Okay. Right. Um, and let me do double movement test and uh, authoritarian rule. So as many of you are undoubtedly aware, that a series of major protests erupted in Hong Kong in 2019 and 2020. Now these protests drew over 2 million people into the streets on any given day, which is a quarter of the Hong Kong population. Uh, and, and not only this is just people on the street, but it also solicited the support of millions more. What I argue is that these protests did not appear suddenly out of nowhere, but were rather preceded by two decades worth of similar protest activity. So just for an example, that according to Hong Kong police statistics, uh, there were around 6,000 protests in, 2020, in 2010, and well over 6,000 annually through 2015. That number then jumped to over 10,000 in 2016 and, still, and stayed well above 10,000 through 2019. So that you see that there's somewhere on the order of an average of over 30 demonstrations marches and protests happening every day, day after day, day in and day out, leading one to conclude that the Hong Kong people living in the early part of this, this century found something terribly wrong with their society. And they were constantly engaged in active opposition and a search for methods, practices, and ideas in order to do something about it. This all came to an abrupt end, of course, uh, on July 1st, 2020. On that day, the national security law was put, into an, was put into effect. So among other things, the national security law criminalizes anti-government speech, and it has been effectively used to silence these protests. Hundreds of activists, politicians, and journalists have been arrested, and some are now serving life sentences on what has been termed subversion. The government has taken ever further measures to give itself broad anti-democratic powers in addition to this national security law. Special national security branches in the Justice Department have been set up and a police force has been set up with the capacity to do, among other things, 
conduct secret surveillance and warrantless searches. Political advocates and advocates and uh, activists have been target, targeted. And in order to ensure that they're prosecuted accordingly, that the legal system has come under increasing manipulation, where to give one example that uh, some judges are being removed who are deemed to, uh, to be unfavorable to national security law rulings. And one of the key arguments of my report is that these developments must be situated globally. Hong Kong is not unique, neither in the protests nor the autocratic crackdown. For the past two weeks, I'm sorry, for the past two decades, I find that the world has experienced an increasing number of popular protests. And at the same time, democratic backsliding and reactionary right-wing authoritarianism is on the rise throughout the world. So to give just one indication of this, that the uh, Economist Intelligence Unit, uh, Unit's Democracy Report, which is one of the key indicators of global democracy, which the Economist puts out uh, every year, that this report found that democracy worldwide is at an all-time low. There is a proliferation of hybrid regimes that use democratic-like institutions to prop up authoritarian leaders, precisely the kind of thing that we see happening in Hong Kong now. Now, the argument advanced in my report is that developments in Hong Kong cannot be separated from these global developments, that Hong Kong must be analyzed within this larger global context. And that analysis, I argue, must begin with shifts in the local and global political economy, which begin in the, in the late 1970s and 1980s. And I go into go into detail to outline what this looks like in the case of Hong Kong, which leads me to the conclusion that the popular backlash and authoritarian consolidation, which is happening in Hong Kong and the world over, uh, is a product of decades long development. And this is being driven, particularly in the case of Hong Kong, by a quickly changing political economy that's creating vast social inequality. Now, considering our response as Americans, I go on to develop a program of political and economic democracy to, do, to address this problem. This is the policy aspect of my report. And I lay out a series of policy responses that think about the promotion of democracy beyond elections and considers different forms of civic engagement and economic justice. Given the time constraints, however, I'm not going to elaborate on these aspects of my report. Rather, since the theme of the panel is the party's interest, I'm going to focus the rest of my time on my analysis of the interest driving Beijing's authoritarian response to Hong Kong protests. This is done with the observation that the physical and legal violence of Beijing is rather surprising, and it forces us to ask why why Beijing has, uh, has come out with such political, um, with such physical and legal violence against uh, protests and continuing uh, today into Hong Kong. Now, as I see it, Beijing's interest in Hong Kong is both financial and political. Financially, Hong Kong has long served as a conduit for domestic and foreign capital to move in and out of China. This is because capital controls in China and limits on foreign investments have made a, fi made a financial center like Hong Kong necessary in order to facilitate the flows of money. But moreover, the Hong Kong financial markets have enabled Chinese companies to set up operation shells to both raise capital and to invest internationally. So in this way, I find that Hong Kong has served as a financial center for China, making it uh, in, in important for the regime in this regard. Now, politically, two key issues inform Beijing's actions in Hong Kong. Territorial integrity is one, and political factions are another. Now, the former, that is the territorial integrity, is more straightforward. And I won't spend much time on it that here. I'll just sum it up by saying, that Beijing wants to ensure that Hong Kong remains uh, a part of China and does not see uh, independence. The later issue of political factions within the CCP is more complicated, as all of us know who study, study China. Party politics are, of course, quite opaque. 
uh, but there is indication, we can get a sense uh, that actions in Hong Kong are a consequence of the Xi Jinping faction attempting to wrestle control from the Jiang Zemin faction. Now the Jiang faction has been in control of Hong Kong politically with members posted to positions in the territory, but also financially with members having links to business and investment. So you both have official networks and unofficial networks. And today Xi Jinping has been whittling away at the official networks and replacing John's people with his own. But you have large unofficial and informal financial networks spread throughout Hong Kong. And this influence is a threat to Xi Jinping and the Xi, and the Xi faction. So the danger here for the Xi faction is not only that a faction hostile to his leadership and policies are going to control Hong Kong, but also that it'll be used as a financial base to launch an internal coup against him. Thus, the overbearing response of the Beijing government can be viewed as an effort to assert internal political control. She has not only moved to put his people in place, as I just mentioned, but also to create extra legal organizations in the form of a national security apparatus and the national security law that gives him internal political control and able to bypass the formal party mechanisms uh, and uh, both legal and political mechanisms. And this national security apparatus includes the national security law, enabling Xi to operate beyond judicial scrutiny and with no constraints in action or, or, uh, or budget over organizations. So in short, Xi's interest here in flushing out a rival party faction has led him to create a supra authority organization in the form of a national security apparatus that is wielded to stifle dissent, both external dissent as well as internal dissent. So in this analysis, a lot of internal politics is also driving Beijing's response here to Hong Kong. So from this perspective, it would follow that Beijing is quite willing to enact autocratic measures in order to ensure control of Hong Kong, even if it comes at the expense of the economy. But not only that, but such measures uh, that are being taken now, which would be a clam which might sacrifice the economy, are deemed as necessary. And they're deemed as necessary in order to constrict the economic activity of the informal networks of rival factions in Hong Kong. Given this, it's not inconceivable that once political and judicial control has been consolidated, she will have the capacity to level capital and financial controls in Hong Kong. And this is just speculation, but it's something that we might see uh, as has already been practiced in the case of, say, the Alibaba and Tencent cases. So here I've offered a brief outline of rather complex yet, yet opaque matter. But in doing so, I've just tried to shed new light on the question of Beijing's interest here in Hong Kong and give a perspective of other aspects of that's going on. And so I look forward to engaging with my fellow panelists and audience members on the matter. Thank you. Thanks, McKay. Um, looking forward to, to hearing more discussion uh, on the party's interest in Hong Kong. Emily, uh, we now turn to you. All right. Well, thank you, Lucas, for uh, stepping in and for all your hard work at the O. Wilson Center. It's been a pleasure to get to know you guys and to uh, do this fellowship um, this year and continue my research um, on why China's uh, war of resistance against Japan, which is um, China's part of World War II, is important to uh, China's um, domestic and international legitimacy and why we should care. So with that, I will get started. So a few years ago, in January of 2017, the People's Republic of China's Ministry of Education made this unprecedented announcement that officially altered the timeline of the War of Resistance Against Japan from eight to 14 years. The new starting date, instead of the Marco Polo Bridge incident, Lugo Tiao Shubian, on July 7th, 1937, was to be the Mukden incident, Jiu Yiba Shubian, on September 18th, 1931. Uh, note, the war's end date in 1945 is not contentious and remains the same. So although this decision may seem to have been exclusively top-down, um, my analysis shows that before 2017, the 14-year timeline was anything but a foregone conclusion. On the contrary, there had been this fierce, uh, um, my term that I use is date debate um, since the 1980s regarding the proper timeline for the war of resistance against Japan. And this date debate um, I find was largely spearheaded by scholars from Northeastern China, Dongbei, 
who vehemently argued that the war timeline should be elongated to start with the invasion of their homeland in 1931. So stepping back a little, the War of Resistance against Japan as a whole has served an increasingly important role in Chinese political consciousness in the past couple decades and has become even more intertwined with the Chinese Communist Party's legitimizing narrative. Under Xi Jinping, the People's Republic of China continues to highlight the war for reasons connected to both domestic and international political legitimacy. Highlighting 14 instead of eight years of resistance not only emphasizes that the Chinese Communist Party, as opposed to the nationalists, was the cornerstone of the war, Zhong Liu Di Zhu in Chinese, but also seeks to convince the international community of China's leading role in World War II. Um, so a little bit of background on the two events I'm discussing. Um, firstly, the Marco Polo Bridge incident on July 7th, 1937. It's still regarded in the people's, uh, people's in, I'm sorry, in the Republic of China on Taiwan as the official starting date of the war, and in the People's Republic of China on the mainland as the start of a national all-out war between China and Japan. In the PRC, it was never the official starting date of the war, but was popularly assumed to be the start of the war before the so-called date debate began. The events of the Marco Polo Bridge incident uh, were not particularly unusual in and of themselves. It was a local skirmish between Japanese and Chinese forces outside the village of Wanping, which is uh, southwest of Beijing. Rather, the significance of the event lies in the powdered keg of latent aggression that this ignited, which uh, stoked all out war between the Nanjing and the Tokyo national governments. Juxtaposed with the Marco Polo Bridge incident, is the Mukden incident, which is now viewed in the People's Republic of China as both the starting date of the so-called partial war and the official starting date of the overall war of resistance against Japan. On September 18, 1931, two junior officers from the Japanese Kwantung Army set off a bomb on a railroad outside the northeastern Chinese city of Mukden, or Shenyang. They blamed the explosion on Chinese rebels and then used it as a pretext to invade Manchuria and establish the puppet state of Manchukuo in the spring of 1932 with Henry Puyi, the Qing Dynasty's last emperor, as its head. So the date debate on whether 1931 or 1937 was the proper starting point for the war of resistance against Japan began really in the 1980s in northeastern China. And if you want any names, I can give you tons of names of northeastern scholars who have been working on this question since the 1980s, as well as a handful of scholars from outside of Northeastern China uh, that, that proposed that the war of resistance start with the Mukden incident. So I'm gonna briefly go over their major arguments, go over the major arguments of their opponents, and then conclude by um, explaining why we should care about this. So um, these Northeastern scholars um, who argued that the war should start in 1931 had a couple of reasons. First, I was surprised actually at how much they relied on analyses of Marxist dialectics. Um, in, so uh, they consistently argued that the Mukden incident changed the principal contradiction or Zhu Yao Mao Dun in Chinese society from domestic class struggle before the Mukden incident to a struggle between the Chinese people and Japanese imperialism afterwards. Um, the second reason, um, they cited was pretty much because Mao Zedong said so, and I was a little surprised at this reason as well, especially since, um, you know, in a lot of scholarly analyses, um, I've read a number of scholars that have argued that um, Mao Zedong has played a less prominent role in intellectual circles in legitimization of various issues after Gaika Kaifang or the reform and opening up. But yet these Northeastern scholars were very adamant in being like, you know, Mao said that the war started in 1931. There's this famous quote they use stating, the war of resistance against Japan developed along a torturous road. This war started in 1931. Third reason, following an eight-year timeline argued that these scholars would merely give further credence uh, to Chiang Kai-shek's infamous non-resistance policy against Japan. So the argument here is that, well, we are not interpreting history according to the nationalist or Guomindang timeline. We need to interpret it according to the people's timeline, which uh, leads me to the next point, which, um, so these scholars argue that the Chinese Communist Party um, underwent extensive resistance uh, um, the Chinese Communist Party led the uh, Chinese people in extensive resistance before 1937, and they argue that the CCP was the true leader of the war effort and the true representative of the Chinese people. 
Five, the sacrifices of the Northeasterners before 1937 must be appropriately recognized. And also noteworthy, these scholars, um, many of them claim that the Mukden incident should not just be the start of the war of resistance against Japan, but also of World War II, uh, which is often called the anti-fascist war, Fan Fascista Zhang Zheng in China as a whole. Um, so by the 1990s, that there was scholarship on the other side, um, arguing that, well, Marco Polo Bridge incident is the better starting date. There had not been this argument before in scholarship since the Marco Polo Bridge incident was just assumed to be the starting date. But now scholars had to actively defend their position after the 1980s. So their reasons in contrast for why 1937 should be the proper starting date were, uh, first of all, after the Marco Polo Bridge incident, uh, the war against Japan went way beyond any other invasion experienced in modern Chinese history in both its scale and death count. Um, two, which was interesting to me, they claim that the 14-year timeline was unduly influenced by Japanese scholarship. Um, and if any of you guys study um, modern Japanese scholarship, um, this war is often referred to as the 15-year war. Um, third reason, it's kind of a slippery slope argument. These scholars argued, well, if the war can be 14 instead of eight years, what would stop it from becoming, say, a 51-year war, starting with the first Sino-Japanese War in 1894? Um, fourth argument, there was no continuous unified resistance to Japan between 1931 and 1937. It was um, very sporadic, uh, which is in contrast to what scholars claim um, who are proposing that the Mukden incident be the appropriate starting date. And fifth reason, before 1937, there was still the possibility of cooperation between the Nanjing and Tokyo governments. So the date debate continued until around 2015, when it largely went silent after a speech made by Xi Jinping to celebrate the 70th anniversary of the end of World War II. Xi noted that the Mukden incident became the starting point of the Chinese People's War of Resistance against Japan and revealed the prologue of the global anti-fascist war. This in turn became the official position of the CCP just two years later. So. Um, I'll conclude by talking briefly about a few reasons why we should care about this date debate and the resulting official change in the timeline of the war of resistance against Japan. Um, I'll propose four reasons uh, why I think we should care. Um, first of all, I think it is so notable that many scholars advocating for the Mukden incident as a starting date for the war have been from Northeastern China. So um, for those of you who have studied Northeastern China or are familiar with Dongbei, um, it's widely compared with America's Rust Belt, a region that was once economically very prosperous but is now struggling to keep pace. Um, in some interviews I conducted with uh, young professionals um, in Shanghai, Many considered the Northeast to be very Yaoyuan or far, far flung and falling behind or Wu Ho. And yet, as the date debate and its resolution show, Northeastern scholars had such a major influence on pushing for the 14 year war timeline. Um, their key role is suggested by the party's official response to the date debate in a 2017 article, in which scholar Cao Ziyang states that. The CCP supported the 14-year timeline as an answer to longstanding appeals by domestic scholars and the common people. These domestic scholars were largely from the Northeast, suggesting that, um, I think this is a good case study, suggesting that far from being a top-down authoritarian monolith, the PRC is deeply impacted by regional interests when it makes policy decisions. Um, second reason, uh, which I want to mention briefly for why this is important, is in the Chinese academic world, contrary to some, some uh, scholarly allegations, the legacy of Marxism, Leninism, Mao Zedong thought has continued to be really crucial for the legitimacy of the CCP, even after Deng Xiaoping's reform and opening up period. Um, I'll concentrate for, I think I just have a couple more minutes on number three and four really fast. And um, so the third reason why we should care is that China is actively using the extended timeline of the war of resistance to promote not just a favorable domestic image, but also a favorable international image today. So China, um, under the leadership of the government in Nanjing, was an allied power in World War II, along with the US, Great Britain, and the USSR. Yet in the West, China's wartime contributions have too often been overlooked, largely due to Cold War politics that saw mainland China quickly shift from ally to foe. So uh, the PRC and its historians are well aware of this lack of knowledge and are seeking to remedy it. Um, Xi, in the same speech that I quoted before in 2015, also mentioned that China's victory in the war had reestablished China's status as a major country in the world. The Chinese people have won the respect of the peace-loving people of the world, and the Chinese nation has won a lofty national reputation. So Xi's emphasis on China's role in the war 
on the international stage shows how China is increasingly utilizing its new collective memory of the war to, um, I'll quote, and a, a famous uh, scholar, a prominent scholar who studies the war of resistance against Japan, Raina Mitter, who stated that China is increasingly utilizing its new collective memory of the war of resistance to create a morally weighted narrative about China's role in the global order. Um, China's present push to project its World War II image onto current geopolitics can be understood in tandem with continued efforts to expand its global influence, as China has an invested interest in portraying its rise as peaceful rather than threatening, and this is largely to assuage the international community's fears that China seeks ultimate hegemony in the global great power competition. Last point, which um, I'll go over really, really quickly, is that I argue that the CCP is engaged in an intentional rewriting of the history of the war of resistance against Japan and of World War II for nationalistic purposes. I think the proper starting date should actually be Marco Polo Bridge um, incident of 1937 uh, for some of the same reasons that some Chinese scholars have pointed out. Um, Namely, that I think um, after the Mukden incident, Chinese resistance in the Northeast um, was quite passive. And for instance, out of the four months and 18 days it took the Japanese to conquer the Northeast, less than 18 of those days consisted of active Chinese military resistance. And partial resistance to Japan after the Mukden incident was um, interrupted and only developed gradually. Um, simply put, before 1937, most Chinese as well as Japanese people did not consider themselves to be at war. Um, and so now I will conclude um, with, um, it would be really easy to dismiss the 2017 party pronouncement that officially set the war timeline at 14 years as a simple rewriting of history from the top down, yet history and politics are rarely so black and white, uh, such as the case with the date debate where many of these scholars from Northeastern China worked to shift party and public opinion. Um, additionally, so it is important to note, although I am claiming that the CCP is engaging in rewriting history, um, it is correct in a, insofar as China. Now what China is, whether China means the nationalist government in Nanjing or the CCP claims that China under the CCP um, is um, a little nebulous, but because of Chinese efforts, um, Chinese efforts contributed greatly to World War II and I think we should recognize this. Um, so if we are, in, if to effectively engage with China in the 21st century, we would do well to both remember its contributions as an allied power, while simultaneously being on the lookout for attempts by the CCP to distort historical veracity for the purposes of political gain. And with there, I will end my presentation. I look forward to a discussion with you guys on this topic. Thanks, Emily, uh, for, your, for your discussion on, on the history of, uh, or how history is viewed by the CCP. Uh, today, now, next we'll turn to Casey, who will be talking a little bit about uh, how the CCP is perhaps less of a unitary actor than is often assumed. Thank you so much. Um, really, thank you, Lucas, and everyone at the Wilson Center for making this uh, conference possible. It's really an honor to be part of this panel, and I'm already you know, learning so much from my fellow panelists. Um, so my paper looks at the domestic sources of China's maritime policy in the Xi era. Um, and you know, over the last decade, China has become even more assertive in the maritime realm. And it's often assumed that Xi Jinping is carefully orchestrating this more assertive behavior. Um, after all, he has repeatedly called for, um, you know, turning the need to turn China into a great maritime power. Um, and he has uh, emphasized um, the importance of, of national rejuvenation, which has stoked the, the popular belief that an increasingly more powerful China ought to take a resolute stance in defending its territorial disputes. Um, and also since coming to power, he has spearheaded a major effort to centralize foreign policy, including maritime policy. Um, but as I show in my paper, although Xi's efforts to centralize maritime policy uh, has indeed resulted in improved coordination, especially among China's maritime security actors, uh, the challenge of policy fragmentation has yet to be entirely resolved. Uh, China's many foreign policy and maritime actors still find ways to pursue their narrower bureaucratic and professional interests. Um, However, uh, Xi Jinping has shaped the incentives of these actors in such a way that uh, rewards more uh, assertive behavior. 
Um, so in, in the paper, I begin by looking at some of the big organizational changes that have been undertaken to centralize maritime policy. Uh, and I focus in particular on those changes that have been made to two very important maritime security actors, uh, maritime law enforcement and the maritime militia. Um, and these are you know, the, the two actors that participate most prominently on the front lines of uh, China's maritime disputes. Uh, so very briefly, with respect to maritime law enforcement, uh, in mid-2013, um, the China Coast Guard, or the CCG, was established, uh, and this involved unifying for uh, previously balkanized maritime law enforcement agencies. Uh, but this overhaul failed to synergize these actors, largely because oversight of the CCG was shared by two competing agencies, uh, the State Oceanic Administration and the Ministry of Public Security. And this created you know, considerable com confusion about the chain of command. Um, so to resolve these issues in 2018, uh, the CCG was put under the command of the People's Armed Police, which at that time had recently been placed solely under the, the leadership of the Central Military Commission. Um, so this, you know, it clarified the chain of command but even though Chinese analysts have continued to point to the failure to clearly differentiate between uh, the, the duties of the CCG and the, the PLA Navy. Uh, and then with respect to the maritime militia, uh, Xi Jinping has spearheaded a drive to expand and professionalize the maritime militia. Uh, and this began with his 2013 uh, trip to Tanmen Township in Hainan. Uh, which is home to one of the most active uh, militias that operates in, in the Spratlys. Um, additionally, oversight of the maritime militia was simplified as part of larger organizational reforms to the PLA. Uh, so under she, a new department under the, the Central Military Commission was created to oversee mobilization work, including the activities of the maritime militia. Um, but even so, local leaders still exert uh, heavy influence um, in interpreting the policies that are set by the Central Military uh, Commission. Um, and together with their local military counterparts, they have retained considerable autonomy in organizing uh, local militia forces. Um, and for local leaders, militia activity is a key way in which they influence outcomes in the maritime uh, domain. Um, they have a vested economic interest in the South China Sea's fishery and hydrocarbon resources, and they thus um, you know, really advocate for more and lobby the center for more financial support uh, for their militias. Um, so in the paper, I, I look at the role that these and other foreign policy actors played in the 2014 uh, Haiyang Shiyou 981 standoff with Vietnam. And this was a standoff that ensued following China's deployment of an oil rig in waters that Vietnam considers to be uh, part of its EEZ. Um, and in this incident, the PLA was able to coordinate with the CCG and the maritime militia in a relatively efficient manner, um, thanks in part to the organizational changes that were being undertaken at the time. Um, but even though China's actions on the water were relatively coordinated, uh, its broader response during the uh, larger bilateral crisis was far less seamless. Um, as the standoff unfolded and as relations with Vietnam deteriorated, the Chinese leadership shifted to prioritize diplomacy. Um, and in order to signal that it wanted to dial down tensions, uh, then State Councilor Yang Jiechi was dispatched to Vietnam but meanwhile, Chinese vessels continue to harass Vietnamese ships. Um, and during this time, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs also appears to have been kept uh, largely in the dark about much of this aggressive behavior. When the spokesperson was asked about the sinking of a, of a Vietnamese fishing boat, for example, uh, she admitted to not knowing about it. Um, now, the, the standoff ended when China withdrew the oil rig ahead of schedule, but shortly after doing so, the PLA Navy South Fleet organized a large scale joint exercise in the Beibu Gulf that involved the CCG and the maritime militia, and that focused on protecting a drilling platform that was very similar to the Haiyang Shiyou. 
And this was only days before Xi Jinping hosted a special envoy of the General Secretary of Vietnam's uh, Communist Party. Right? And so these provocative exercises arguably risked uh, undermining the credibility of, of Xi's attempts at diplomacy. Um, now, since the 2014 incident, Xi Jinping has, of course, further consolidated his authority including over China's maritime security actors, uh, and especially the military. Um, so it is possible that today the PLA, CCG, and maritime militia would now be more sensitive uh, to when the, leader, uh, the leadership signals that diplomacy is to take precedence. Um, but at the same time, the nationalistic political environment that she has continued to foster since then uh, only makes it more difficult to rein in these actors. Um, so this, this standoff was significant because China's assertiveness here was unprovoked, right? This was not like previous episodes in which China's assertiveness is often described as reactive. Um, and it's an incident in which China's disparate um, foreign policy and, and maritime actors, at least initially, converged around a more assertive behavior. Um, so the behavior of, of the actors involved in this standoff and beyond certainly does align with Xi's emphasis on you know, the need to defend China's sovereignty. Um, but he hasn't mapped out in precise detail the specific steps that they must take uh, to do so. Uh, so I suggest that they've converged around assertiveness uh, because of the incentive structure under which they operate, which is also shaped uh, by Xi. Um, so steps that she has taken to consolidate his personal power have reinforced bureaucratic and professional incentives that align with a more uh, assertive maritime posture. Um, so on the one hand, the heightened nationalism that she has cultivated provides political cover for subnational actors to push their own interest in a tougher maritime policy. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, she's emphasis on ideological conformity, as well as his anti-corruption campaign have underscored incentives for foreign policy actors, including those that may not have had hawkish preferences to begin with, uh, to shore up their, their patriotic credentials. Um, you know, in today's political climate, right, given the high cost of making political mistakes, officials have reason to believe that it is safer to err on the side of being too patriotic than uh, not patriotic enough. Um, and furthermore, the increased scrutiny under which officials are operating makes it tempting for them, again, to, to seek political cover by appealing uh, to nationalism. Uh, so what does all of this mean for the United States? Well, the decent decentralized incentive structure under which China's foreign policy actors are operating makes uh, China's aggression in the maritime space uh, all the more difficult to counter. Um, Again, she has gone out of his way to fuel nationalism and would find it costly to pull back uh, these actors. So um, in responding to acts of Chinese aggression, I think it's important that the US uh, think seriously about how we can shape um, the incentives driving these actors directly, uh, such as through targeted forms of punishment, um, like sanctions that target the commercial interests of, of the maritime militia units that are involved in harassing foreign vessels, for example. Um, and at a higher level, you know, I think there's a need to be careful about misattributing each aggressive move by Chinese maritime security actors to uh, strategic intentions, um, because there are important domestic political factors at play and ignoring them um, helps to justify an overly blunt approach uh, to countering China that could end up amplifying uh, these internal pressures that would make it even more difficult for Xi to rein, rein in these actors. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll end here. Um, look forward to your comments and questions. And again, uh, thank you to the Wilson Center uh, for this opportunity. Thanks, Casey, uh, for your excellent uh, presentation on the South China Sea and, and the role of the many actors involved there. Um, Joseph, uh, last but not least, uh, we turn to you. So today I want to talk about Xi Jinping and ideology. If you pick up a newspaper or a think tank report, you very 
often see claims that Xi Jinping is a more ideological leader of China than his predecessors, Hu Jintao, Jiang Zemin, Deng Xiaoping. We also see claims that the contest between China and the United States is ideological, which means that it has similarities uh, with the Cold War uh, between Washington and Moscow. According to this narrative, what it, ideology essentially means that uh, people who are uh, ideological are irrational, aggressive, they bend facts to fit the truth. Uh, and this view of seeing ideology as a sort of keystone variable, I think is seductive because to understand what China and Xi Jinping wants is as simple as going and reading uh, the old Marxist canon. So for example, during the Cold War, John Foster Dulles uh, used to uh, tell people to read Stalin's Problems of Leninism, saying that it was the present day communist Bible that gives us the same preview Hitler gave in Mein Kampf. Uh, Dulles would even open the book with surprising accuracy to prove any point. So today, I don't want to deny that ideology is important for understanding China, but I do want to make the case that saying that ideology is a dichotomous variable, meaning that someone either is or isn't ideological, and that whether someone is ideological can uh, explain everything that they do, uh, is problematic. I want to argue against this, this recipe book view uh, of ideology that suggests that reading these old texts uh, of Marx and Lenin and Stalin will, will be the, uh, the key to predicting behavior. Uh, and to do that, I proceed in the paper uh, in two ways. The first is I review uh, the literature uh, of social scientists on ideology. Uh, and a few elements stand out. The first is ideology has been used in a dizzying number of different ways. There's one article by John Gehring who notes that uh, scholars have debated whether ideology is a tool used to explain, repress, integrate, motivate, or legitimate. Uh, people debate whether uh, ideology is something that is interest-based or non-interest-based. Uh, Gehring even listed 16 typologies as to whether or not a particular cognitive effective structure fits more or less on the ideological spectrum. Uh, historians of the Soviet Union in particular have also uh, suggested that if you don't historicize ideology and say what you mean uh, for specific cases or at certain times, uh, you essentially obscure more than you illuminate. Also, I believe that a recipe book view of ideology fails to account for politics and contingency. Uh, it underestimates the Leninist toolkit and tactical flexibility, uh, and also underestimates the opportunities for compromise and cooperation. Also, people who very easily go to these ideological explanations, I feel don't have a good uh, grasp of just how, from a methodological point of view, difficult it is to make an ideological case as opposed to something else. So in fact, one of the first and earliest most famous attempts to explain behavior uh, was by an individual named Nathan Leitz who worked for the Rand Corporation who came up with this idea uh, of the Bolshevik code. Uh, he believed that Bolsheviks were motivated by homosexual tendencies uh, so uh, later, Alexander George, one of the most famous political scientists, um, especially methodologists in the history of the discipline, tried to save uh, the idea of the operational code without going to these very um, sort of psychosexual explanations for what communists were up to. Uh, and he said he came up with two terms. One was this con uh, congruence approach where you would say, well, if the person is talking about the world in a particular way and then acts in a particular way, you can sort of guess that there is a cause and effect relationship there. But I think people can pretty obviously see an immediate problem with that, which is if, if just because somebody talks about ideas uh, doesn't necessarily mean that they're actually motivated by them. So for example, somebody uh, who wants to achieve a particular goal might use a particular legitimation strategy that they don't actually believe. Uh, so, George also suggested this idea of process tracing, this idea that you would take a step farther with the evidence and you wouldn't just look for this match that I, that I described to you, uh, but that you would actually trace the decision and try to determine whether or not it was an idea uh, that caused the person to make the decision as opposed to something else. Now, political scientists uh, have reacted to that 
saying that, well, it doesn't exactly, it's not exactly clear what it would mean to make an ideational um, case or not, um, precisely because people are motivated by multiple different elements at the same time. So they have said that uh, it doesn't make sense to, to uh, argue that you can see the content of ideas and claim that they have homogenous effects, but a more useful endeavor is to conceptualize how ideas shape, constrain, orient, and guide. Now, in terms of the historiography of how scholars have studied ideology in the Soviet Union and China, as more evidence has come out of the Chinese uh, and Soviet archives, we've seen uh, just how bad of a track record that we have had uh, as scholars in terms of understanding just exactly um, ideology works in these states. So uh, let me give two examples uh, as they relate to Mao Zedong. So when people say that an individual is Maoist, they tend to mean that they're radical, that they're leftist, that they're extreme. But if you look at the course of Mao's career, one of the reasons that so many people were loyal to him was that uh, for so much uh, of Mao's time as leader of the Communist Party, he was extraordinarily practical. He was extraordinarily flexible. And even uh, after uh, Mao uh, turned to class struggle, we do see times when he could still be quite flexible uh, and we would see the world uh, force um, course corrections upon him, suggesting that across different issue areas and across different times, Mao could be a very different uh, individual. Uh, and also uh, we've seen that people have debated whether or not Mao Zedong and Liu Shaoqi were these two competing lines. Uh, the new evidence shows that actually Liu Shaoqi could, could be extraordinarily leftist, extraordinarily brutal, uh, and that this idea of two lines was actually an artifact of a post hoc justification um, for what was a power struggle um, about the succession and other reasons as well. But also, and I'll finish with this, is that if we look at the Xi family itself, it's also a case study in how uh, ideology can not matter in ways that often we would su suspect. So for example, Xi Jinping's father, Xi Zhongshun, is often seen as this quintessential reformer, someone who uh, never made leftist mistakes, someone who was not a radical. But if we look at his career, it's actually a good case for um, suggesting that that view as being meaningful of a left-right spectrum in Chinese politics is being very problematic. One of those reasons is there's actually very little space uh, for individuals who are not the top leader um, to fight for whatever um, policy platform that they might support. Also, uh, you may have certain biases, but when you face particular concrete positions, uh, excuse me, concrete uh, problems, uh, you will react to them as such. So uh, Xi Zhongshen, for example, he supported the special economic zones, which were the symbol uh, of China's reform and opening up, but he opposed the household responsibility system uh, showing that on these two key elements of reform, he actually came down in different areas. Uh, he learned, uh, for example, um, he saw how policies failed in the Northwest towards uh, uh, Muslim minorities and decided that the party had caused a lot of those programs which shaped his United Front attitudes later. Um, sometimes his positions can be very emotional. So he wanted to overcome the strongman leadership of the Mao era, but he had a very strong personal attach, um, attachment to Mao and would yell at people who criticized him, even though he lost one of his daughters to the Cultural Revolution. And also whether or not you are uh, um, a leftist or a rightist within the Chinese Communist Party, we have to remember that it's a relative thing. So even if Xi Jinping, more than many other people thought that it was at least possible to solve problems by negotiation and talking, after the crackdown in 1989, he still came out publicly uh, and supported um, the violence um, to resolve the crisis. Finally, Xi Jinping himself, what makes him so interesting is that if you read what he said about himself from when he was a teenager to today, you will see that there are these two shticks uh, in, throughout his writings and speeches. And one of those shticks is that I am a, not a dogmatic individual, that the cultural revolution taught me the mistakes of leftist policies, and that we should never judge a policy on whether or not it's socialist or capitalist. We should judge it by uh, on concrete policy outcome terms. This is something that he's talked about through his entire life. He's linked it to the cultural revolution and, and working uh, in Hubei, uh, particularly 
um, a poor region that was particularly driven by cultural revolution factionalism uh, all through um, Fujian and Zhejiang to the present day. But what's also in so, so interesting is at the same time, he talks about his obsession with ideals and conviction. And this idea that the Chinese Communist Party faces an existential threat if people do not believe in the Communist Party's mission. Uh, and he talked about this because during the Cultural Revolution, so many people were disillusioned. And again, in the 1980s, when people uh, were wondering about what it meant to move towards more market economy, uh, they again started to wonder about, um, about values. And he positioned himself as someone who wanted to become a member of the Chinese Communist Party um, because it's the forging that he experienced in his strong beliefs and because he never wanted another cultural revolution to happen again. Uh, so what does all this mean? Well, looking to the future, I think that ideology will manifest in Xi Jinping's behavior in ways similar to his predecessors. He'll carry ideational priors more strongly in some areas than others. When goals conflict with one another, he'll shift uh, among them flexibly. Uh, the party will continue massive efforts and ideological indoctrination, but the messaging will be more about the party's greatness than concrete leftist um, cultural revolution style policies. The real world uh, will force course corrections. Uh, but, but also I wanna conclude by saying that there are two factors that might shift this balance of competing tendencies. Uh, the first is that she believes the United States opposes Beijing for both ideological and power political reasons that American efforts to undermine the CCP will only increase as China rises, and that Washington uses ideological infiltration to achieve that goal. And second, as Xi's uh, time as the top leader continues and the propaganda apparatus increasingly emphasizes his stature, uh, the prospect of so-called leftist adventures may become increasingly tempting, but ultimately the answer to how these competing dynamics will resolve won't be found just by reading um, Stalin's problems of communism. Thanks, Joseph. So today we've uh, begun parsing out some of the complexities inherent to the CCP, even under Xi Jinping, as, as he has you know, consolidated control personally. There are a lot of, uh, the CCP is not quite as unitary as it, as it is often seen, uh, seen as. And, and beyond this, you know, the party's interest shifts over time. Its view of history, its, its look at how it uh, approaches the problems of, say, Hong Kong. And so with that, I want to open up discussion to our panelists and to the audience to send in questions. For the audience, uh, you may submit questions directly for the speakers via email at, uh, to asia at wilsoncenter.org. And for our panelists, if you have any questions, just raise your hand and, and I'll call on you. Um, so with that, I think we can start with McCabe. Emily, do you want to go first? No, no, go ahead. Okay. So I uh, I, I have uh, I, I have questions for my for my fellow panelists. Uh, the, I'll try to I'll, I'll try to be try to be brief. I, I have a question for 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 each of you. So first for for Emily, I thought the the uh, the research is quite fascinating and uh, and looking at these different positions of which are emerging about how to determine the the origins of uh, World War II for for China. My question is about the role of foreign scholars in the debates, if there is any at all. Um, I, I read the, the, these works uh, for my general's examination, and, uh, and but mainly like the classical stuff. I don't know if there's uh, scholars more recently who are doing work on this period, and if so, are they engaging with these debates? Uh, so it's the question about whether uh, like American European scholars writing in English are engaging with these debates that you're referring to, but as well as these debates that you're referring to, are they referring then also to foreign scholars and their engagement? My question for Casey uh, is, so you mentioned all the, these internal, these in, the internal developments uh, which are driving uh, and, and responsible for some of the, 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 uh, the, the, the developments in maritime activity of what you're talking about. I, can you speculate at all of a factional of how much factional politics is driving this? I know it's largely speculative, um, but I, I don't I, I don't know if you could entertain me for a little bit. You know how much of of like the internal factions are at work in creating any type of the dynamics of what you're referring to, and particularly one instance of which I'm thinking of uh, because it's, it's been mentioned in some of the analysis of which I've seen, which is about uh, a Hong Kong 
uh, boat, which uh, a couple of years ago was in the Gallutai waters, and it created this. It, this it created this fur um, about uh, you know China and Japan and their sovereignty over Gallutai. And some of the analysis which I heard, which was speculating that this was a part of factional politics that you had some of the anti-Xi factions sending a ship there in order to disrupt international relations and make Xi look bad or force him into a position where he has to do something which is going to prove his fodder for his factional allies. I don't know if you've heard of this incident at all, if you can comment on it. Um, and then for, uh, for Joseph, um, my, my, my question is like, can we, so I think you made a convincing case about ideology um, and what's at work here and, and the, 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 the fallacy of relying on ideology in order to understand this. Uh, can we get a sense though of what she is up to, of what his, of, of what might inform his thinking about an issue if it isn't an ideological position? Um, so another way of asking this might be, uh, is it just, uh, political, is it just politics and policy positions which might drive policymakers' decisions on something? Or uh, you know, how much can, would ideology account for understanding what, how a leader or how policymakers might make, make policy? And particularly in this case of Xi Jinping, uh, is there something more fundamental that we might account for some kind of ideology in order to further understand what he's up to and make sense of the various activities and policies of which he's putting forth. Thank you. Emily, do you wanna take that first then? Yeah, sure. Well, wow, okay, those are some great questions. I'll try to answer mine as uh, well as I can. Um, in terms of foreign scholarship and foreign scholars and their interactions with Chinese scholars on this, I did uh, see some citations from particularly Japanese and Russian scholars advocating for this 14 or 15 year war as opposed to an eight year war. Um, there, I mean, there is another article I read which engaged with some uh, Western scholars, but by and large, there wasn't all that much engagement besides, you know, Japanese and um, Russian scholars, not much engagement with Western scholars on this. And certainly I haven't seen many Western scholars who have been paying attention to this date debate. I think I'm one of the first, honestly. Um, you know, if anybody out there also studies this, I would love to chat with you. But yeah, to my knowledge, there haven't been that many Western scholars who have studied this. I mean, it's largely been, you know, a domestic issue within the Chinese scholarly world. Casey? Uh, great, yeah, thank you, Monkey, for the, for the excellent question. Um, on whether um, factional politics are, are driving the dynamics here, um, you know, I, I'm not totally sure, and I can't speak on the specific example that you raised. Uh, but in the case that I looked at, the, the 2014 uh, Haiyang-Shiyou incident uh, with Vietnam, what, what was interesting was that the decision, um, you know, the, the whole expedition of the oil rig into um, waters that Vietnam says is, is, is its EEZ, uh, this was, it was directed by the China National uh, Petroleum Corporation or CNP, CNPC. Um, and interestingly, this was amidst um, ongoing corruption probes into the company's senior leadership. Um, and at the time, um, that included the sister-in-law of, of Zhou Yongkong. Um, so th there, there's interesting dynamics there, and it could be that the CNPC officials had an extra incentive to, to you know, demonstrate their patriotic chops in order to sort of, I don't know, buy them political cover because of the the really intense scrutiny that they were facing. So that is uh, an interesting question in the sense that if ideology uh, doesn't matter, why should we study individuals in the first place? Is there anything that ideology actually can tell us? Uh, which I guess gets to attention in my work, which is why am I spending so much time telling you about what Xi Jinping thinks while I'm also saying that uh, ideology can't tell us everything? Uh, again, I think that uh, when we think about ideology, it, we shouldn't think about it as either being um, useful or useless uh, or individuals being ideological or unideological, but that it really depends on the context. 
uh, and contingency. And that if we absolutize what ideology can or can't tell us, um, then I think it's just as problematic as a purely uh, um, realist from an international relations perspective or, um, uh, or utilitarian account. And that ultimately what's the most useful is to um, bring a, a methodological eclecticism um, explanatory eclecticism uh, to uh, whatever it is that you're trying to explain and say, uh, what what do we mean when we say that this is an ide ideological um, decision or not? What does it mean when we're saying that an appreciation for the role of ideas in politics um, is useful or not? Uh, but ultimately, in terms of, you know, the policy relevance, uh, I think absolutely people should read what Xi Jinping is saying, uh, but not to treat it as this idea that once you read his book, like like Patton in the, in the famous movie where he thinks he beat Rommel because he read the book, because that will uh, underestimate the Leninist toolkits, will underestimate flexibility. Uh, it will at least occasionally, um, but not always underestimate when there are possibilities for compromise and cooperation. And that when it comes to Xi Jinping, if you, if you asked him, um, you know, what he thinks about ideology, and we, we kind of know because he talks about it so much, is that um, we don't see this um, dogmatic uh, language. In fact, one of his shticks from the very beginning to today, what he prides himself on and what he legitimates himself on is a rejection of, of Maoist-style uh, radicalism and a rejection of these ways of talking in the 80s and 90s about we should decide whether it's capital or socialist, where he's saying, no, we should decide whether or not it's useful or not. But at the same time, you know, you can have that flex flexible side coexist with the more um, I don't want to say radical side, but, but but what I mean is this also this preoccupation with ideals and motivations and this idea that everybody needs um, to believe in the Communist Party, otherwise otherwise the game is up. Emily? Yeah, sorry to make you work hard, Joseph, but I have another question for you. Um, so as a historian, I was fascinated by um, your revelation that perhaps the Mao Zedong versus Liu Xiaoqi line um, is not actually historically accurate, because that's what I've taught in my classes, that particularly before the Cultural Revolution, you have Mao Zedong and Lin Biao on the one hand, the like radicals, and then you have Deng Xiaoping and Liu Xiaoqi as kind of the more pragmatic faction. So my mind was just kind of blown by the fact that like this might have been historiographically, you know, inaccurate. Would you mind elaborating on that a little? Yeah, so I think that, uh, unfortunately, the study of elite politics in China has atrophied uh, within the United States. So you had this sort of old guard who did this kind of research, but for methodological reasons in political science and history, what the new evidence says, um, and even more unfortunately, what new Chinese party historians working in the PRC have been arguing, um, hasn't really gotten into the um, Western uh, um, syllabi just yet. Uh, so uh, we talked about political science and we talked about history, but I feel that, especially for my, my book that's coming out in April, um, it's almost primarily a work of translation. I have my own stuff in there too. Um, but what I argue is that um, we used to think that after Stalin and Mao died, there was this contest between radicals and dogmatists and conservatives against these reformers, and it was all resolved in this party um, uh, democ democratic, or as close as you get to democratic inter-party democracy um, type approach. But actually all of these ideas um, were artifacts of, as I suggested earlier, this need to tarnish your opponent after they've already been defeated, right? So in the book, I talk about the Gang of Four and Hua Guofeng actually not as being united by a radical philosophy as people say. Um, I don't talk so much about Liu Xiaoqi, but in terms of Liu Xiaoqi, um, what, what that story was between 1962 and 1966 wasn't so much, um, you know, moderates versus radicals. It was Liu Xiaoqi and the social um, education campaign actually going even more f further than Mao and, and Mao being inspired by some of what Liu was saying and, um, and Liu being ex extremely brutal towards these members of the CCP. Um, but uh, what happened was is uh, Mao was worried that uh, Leo uh, wasn't sufficiently um, loyal to him personally, meaning that it was a power political thing that was masked sort of as this ideological thing. And it was that was how Mao put it for, for sort of complicated reasons uh, in terms of justification. Uh, so 
I have to be careful about going too much into these details, so I'll stop. That's fascinating. Thank you. So we had a few questions from the audience coming in. Um, and, and first, I'd like to start with you, McCabe. So you, you talked about how you need to situate the, our understanding of Hong Kong in recent years in an international context. And I'm curious your thoughts on whether, is, is China driving this context through its own actions? You know, for instance, the rise of authoritarianism, or is it you know, taking advantage of, of, of the, 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 this, this change in, in international you know, in authoritarianism, or is it being influenced by this? I mean, I think that that's an interesting uh, point some of the audience raised. Yeah, good, good question. Uh, so the, uh, uh, China is very, I, so as I see it, China is very much at the, at, at the heart of this. And what you see, uh, partially, it's, partially it's driving it. Um, and partially it's taking advantage of an international situation and building allies uh, in, in various ways with um, some of these less democratic regimes and encouraging democratic backsliding. Um, so there, uh, some commentators have referred to this as the, uh, the Autocracy Inc. Uh, this network of autocratic rulers of which are forming throughout the world. And at the heart of that is China uh, and Russia. And what we see happening is that various regimes that are begin to engage in democratic backsliding uh, throughout the world, and most recently uh, is in Latin America that we've seen in some places like Ecuador, uh, that uh, as soon as they're isolated, that sanctions uh, or uh, backlash from the US and Europe, that China and Russia will step in and they'll say, effectively, they'll say, don't worry about it. And they'll sign new uh, economic deals and things in order to alleviate the sanctions that are placed uh, upon them. Uh, further than that, that they've begun holding conferences uh, and sharing techniques of repression and, and democratic backsliding uh, among them. Uh, and, you know, some there's uh, there's and there, there, there's there's various different levels of which they go in order to in, in order to address this ways of manipulating the judiciary ways of circumventing uh, circumventing uh, vote uh, elections and so and so on and so forth um, and so at the heart of this of course is China and Russia because they are the largest economies of this uh, uh, of these. Uh, of these blocks, and they have been able to leverage that in order to support these other uh, the, these these other regimes. And so, I think from this, then it has continued to uh, it's continued to proliferate. Interesting, and I, and I guess in light of that that your point, I wonder how much China's attempt to you know let's say support authoritarianism is that is that pragmatism. Is, it, is this benefiting its interests more so than ideology? I'm thinking in terms of Joseph's point about Xi Jinping being you know, somewhat pra pragmatic in the context. And, and I wonder about your thoughts, Joseph, on that. Yeah, I think it's extraordinarily difficult to distinguish between interest and ideology uh, um, because these, uh, this is sort of gets back to these, you know, different ways that people have used ideology. Sometimes you can say that um, somebody is behaving in a merely ideological way, meaning they're acting in a way that's not according to their interests. Um, but other people say that ideology is interest-based because you have this ruling power uh, and they come up with an ideological superstructure um, to justify it um, and they believe in it and they um, and, and they try to get to, to execute it. So it sort of depends on, again, what you mean by, by ideology and also, we need to keep in mind that in specific cases, people, um, you know, have to face um, concrete, uh, concrete challenges. But um, I do think that when it comes to Xi Jinping, uh, he certainly, uh, if you want to talk about motivations, one thing I do feel feel very powerful about um, is that this is somebody who really does not want to be the person leading the People's Republic of China when the regime collapses. Uh, I think that has to do with his personal history, um, with his personal philosophy. I think this is somebody who really sees the meaning of his life uh, as a member of the Communist Party. It's not just an organization. It's not just a job. Um, for him, it's a vocation. It's a guild. 
Um, he sees himself as the inheritor of the revolution, the successor to the, re um, to the revolution. Um, so whatever he does, I think, is ultimately loyal um, to um, this idea of himself, um, which also, as I said, I think has to do with his obsession about whether or not other people are feeling the same way and, uh, and, and so on. So one of the, Lucas, I can just make a, make a quick point. So one of the things that we see happening, which is different among this, uh, the emergence of this kind of uh, autocracy is the lack of an adherence to, to, to an ideology, whether it's you know, communism or, or, or fascism or whatnot, uh, but just more of a concern of power. And you see this you know, from, from Hungary to dictators in, in, in Latin America and, uh, and, and, and throughout, uh, throughout the world, uh, but is an interest just in maintaining and, and, holding, and holding power. Uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, so, so for China and its position here, I think that it's, uh, it's concerned uh, in developing uh, a block of supporters. So you take, for example, the, um, uh, the op-ed that, that uh, the Chinese ambassador with the, uh, wrote together with the Russian ambassadors to the US in opposition to Biden's democracy summit last December, critiquing the US and US form, form of democracy. Um, and what they're doing in this, uh, and which is reverberating then throughout their actions and their support of these other uh, dictators or, or pseudo dictators throughout the world is building an alternative power block. And so in this way, I would say that it is practical in terms of uh, uh, developing in, in, in alternative foreign policy and uh, alternative to, to the US in say like a great power struggle. Thanks. So, so Casey, your, your discussion on whether you know, China, has, the CCP itself has, has much more, you know, many more voices than is often assumed is, is really interesting, especially because the South China Sea is often considered a high profile issue for China. And so I can imagine on issues like say, so I studied Southeast Asia predominantly and, and in Myanmar, a lot of China's policy towards the country is, is driven in, in Yunnan by local actors who are op operating somewhat autonomously on, on some of these issues. And, and so I'm curious what, what you make of that larger, you know, that, that's such an important issue in South China Sea is, is there's some pushback on the local level from Beijing's dictate, uh, dictats, right? So what is your, uh, interpretation of that? What do, what do you think U.S. policymakers should think about regarding that? Yeah, so part of the reason why I was motivated to, to focus on the South China Sea was because it, it's sort of, it's a difficult case, right, for an argument that policy remains fragmented, because as you mentioned, it is of such great importance to, to the party. You would expect there to be um, just you would expect there to be a whole lot of, of coordination, which I find, but it's not, the coordination I find is not across um, all foreign policy actors, at least to the extent that you would expect with an issue of such great importance. Um, part of, you know, another example of this sort of uh, fragmentation that we see in China's foreign policy, in addition to the example you mentioned of, of China's Southeast Asia policy being being run out of um, you know, provinces on China's southern border um, would be um, how China carries out uh, its, its informal or unofficial economic uh, coercion or its sanctions. Um, it, it oftentimes relies on local officials to um, carry out these, these forms of punitive behavior um, you know, to target foreign companies operating in their jurisdictions and all of that. Um, but in another project, what I found is that you know, others, other local officials um, will also take it upon themselves to, to protect these foreign commercial interests. So you do see a lot of variation um, across, the, across um, um, China, at least. Um, you know, uh, in, in these examples. And I think it just, it really just <laughs> goes to show that even under Xi Jinping, China cannot be treated as a, a monolithic actor, right? She, and under Xi, we tend to think of him as, of course, he's, he's chair, chairman of everything, the most powerful leader in the world, et cetera. But even he cannot micromanage um, all of the folks within the system, 
that's interesting because it, it kind of ties to Emily's discussion about how a lot of the Northeast debate is, is pushed by local Northeast based uh, you know, academics. And, and I'm interested to, to turn to Emily here and, and talk a little bit about that because I wonder, so was this picked up in, in Beijing because this was useful from the, the perspective of the CCP, oh, we can take advantage of this debate or, or was there a lot more you know, room for, for could you say that then, then these actors were actually driving this debate in the CCP themselves? I mean, I'm, I'm just kind of curious on, on the pathway uh, or the mechanism uh, for this influence. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Unfortunately for my project, because of COVID, I was not able to go to China and conduct more on the ground interviews. So I mostly had to rely on scholarly art, Chinese scholarly articles online about this. So um, that remains a very pertinent topic for further research, the fancy way of saying I'm not quite sure. But, um, you know, I do think there was political pressure um, placed on, um, you know, the Beijing apparatus by um, North, Northeastern officials. So I do think um, at a certain level, there was that political pressure. But um, I also think that it was just in the CCP's interests to pick up on this debate and take the side of a 14 year war, as I mentioned in my talk, um, a 14 year war um, leg further legitimizes the CCP both um, domestically and internationally by making it so that, um, well, domestically it um, kind of shows that the CCP was resisting Japan for far longer than the nationalists, right? And then um, internationally, it uh, goes to show that China, by which the uh, CCP means itself, conveniently kind of like overshadowing the fact that it was actually the Nanjing government that was in charge during the war. Um, internationally, it creates this kind of like moral legitimizing narrative for the CCP's actions in today's world. So I, mean, I think it's probably a combination of both, but I think it was like there was political pressure, but then it was also just politically very expedient for Beijing to pick up this narrative. That's, that's really interesting because I think, you know, looking at, at these questions of history and, and, and writ large kind of narratives, you, the, I think the common assumption is that the, the, the central you know, state is driving a lot of these, these narratives. It's, it's pushing for you know, political purposes, right, out of a sense of pragmatism, perhaps, you know, this is a benefit. I mean, I'm thinking, um, looking at it in a historical you know, the historiography perspective, there's been other, there are other debates that, that, uh, that the Chinese government's weighed in on. I mean, there's the Goguryeo, you know, ancient Korean kingdom debate, or whether it's Korean or Chinese in the Northeast, uh, you know, and I'm curious if you have any thoughts on that, um, or, you know, the Qing dynasties, you know, whether the, the, there's China proper versus, you know, how it viewed territories like Xinjiang, and, 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 and obviously those are very large impacts on, on how uh, the CCP is legitimized or the, its claims to sovereignty and, and territorial integrity. And, and so I'm just curious, you know, in those cases, or at least if, if you've looked at them at all, is there this, you know, kind of top, bottom up, you know, uh, driving, you know, force or is it, you know, or is this Northeast example more unique? Oh, I wish I had looked at those case studies. They sound fascinating. I have seen um, just like, you know, making the rounds on Weibo and stuff, um, this, um, these kind of arguments about the Qing dynasty and its former territories and tied in with the century of humiliation and, oh, this part of Siberia and Mongolia, et cetera, should be China's. Um, but I don't think the central government has weighed in on that because that would have a lot of international, like, you know, very severe international implications, especially with, you know, Russia right now, as I mean, several people have mentioned already, uh, Russo-Chinese relations are getting closer by the day. And I think um, World War II legacy has an important part to play in that as well, but um, not to make too far of a digression, but they're using that to kind of prop up their, not alliance, but more friendlier relations. Um, but yeah, the interesting thing is that Northeastern, like, this, this debate between Northeastern scholars and later these other groups who um, thought this date debate, like the starting date should be different dates. Like the Chinese government didn't decisively weigh in on it really for several decades. So it was, it's interesting that the Chinese government let this debate go on in kind of the public intellectual sphere for so long before weighing in on it. So I think with some of these issues, um, I guess it depends on the party's ultimate goals, whether or not it thinks it would be beneficial to weigh in. But I do find it interesting that this debate started in the 1980s, but it wasn't until like 2015 that Xi Jinping like 
really forcefully speaks to it. And then you see the day to day kind of stop and everyone suddenly starts agreeing with each other that, oh yeah, it's a 14 year war. Um, but yeah, it, it's definitely an interesting question. I can, as a, a trained as a Qing historian, I can say a few words about the debates on the, on the Qing here. And interesting, it seems to map very much on what Emily is saying. Also beginning in the 1980s uh, and stretching through the 90s and the party not playing much of a role or weighing in on this until a little bit later. So, um, and it's debates about sort of like internal colonization and whether the Qing were a, an outside force which then occupied uh, Xinjiang and Tibet and Mongolia and these other, these, these other areas which came under the, 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 the central rule from Beijing under the, under the Qing dynasty where previously they were not. And as these academic debates got going, then the party decided that it was a bit dangerous because if we say that it's not, it wasn't part of China and then only under these foreign Manchu invaders that it became part of China, this has implications of whether Xinjiang is actually part of China at all or not. And what this, of how this kind of got, uh, so, you know, anecdotally or speaking, you know, personally of how this, how you experience this is working in, uh, Qing archives that there's limitations of, of what you can access, and especially in terms of foreign, in terms of non-Chinese language sources. So, for example, I, I you know I was working in Manchu on my on my first book, uh, and there were times when you could not access Manchu sources where it was deemed too too sensitive because it was maybe scholars looking into this they would say that these areas were not part of were not were. We're not we're not part of China, um, and uh, you know I've 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 I have friends who have had their uh, been invited to speak and they've had their their talks shut down because they were talking about like Manchu colonialism or, or the occupation of different areas and it was deemed too uh, too sensitive and so I think in in like maybe the 2010s or so that this party line got hammered out about what the Qing was and how we should think how you should think about the Qing. So Emily has talked oh, about, sorry. Go ahead. please go ahead. I was just gonna say, um, McCabe, I hope that your experience in the Qing archives and that of your friends does not foreshadow what will happen with research on the war of resistance against Japan within China, but you never know. I mean, there's this official interpretation that's gaining more credence now. And, you know, it's so concerned with party legitimacy now that you never know. Yeah, so Emily was talking about the War of Resistance and McCabe was talking about um, Qing historiography. Uh, I suppose I could say something about uh, PRC politics since 1949 and how Xi Jinping views uh, those narratives. Uh, I think that uh, especially elite politics when it comes to uh, party history uh, has always been a third rail of extraordinary sensitivity. Uh, and part of that is because these are individuals who gave up their lives to the party. Many of them lost friends, family to the revolution, and their entire um, sense of self-being has to do with how the party officially views them and their contributions um, to the revolution. So uh, though the story of that sensitivity and the ability for de debates about party history to become explosive to a large extent is the story of Xi Jinping's father, um, because this is an individual who was purged from the leadership because of a novel um, that was seen as an attempt to rehabilitate his old friend Gao Gang, who had been purged from the leadership in the early 1950s, uh, in a way of saying that the Northwest um, battlefield, the Northwest base camp, showed that um, the local leaders there, like Liu Zhidang, but by association Xu Zhongshun, were at least as good as Mao, uh, if not better, um, which, when talked about in a particular way, can be you know, very, very dangerous. And since Xi, Jinping, she, since, excuse me, since Xi Jinping has come to power, people have talked about him as like rewriting history and um, you know, being very daring about reinterpretations, but I think he's actually been extraordinarily careful. So for example, the Lin Biao family went to him and said, look at all this evidence, we need to rehabilitate Lin Biao, he said no. The Hu Yaobang family went to him and said, look at all this evidence, we need to rehabilitate him, he said no. Um, the Gao Gang family, again, this is one of Xi Jinping's best friends. Um, they said, why, is, why are we not, you know, rehabilitating um, Gao Gang? He said no. Even today, that novel that I just mentioned cannot be published in the PRC. Xi Jinping is the leader of the country, and this is the novel that got his father thrown in jail, and it still cannot be published openly. Um, and when you read the historical document that came out a few months ago, 
it almost feels like somebody went back to read it and make sure over and over and over again that continuities were stressed enough. So reform and opening is praised to the skies. Um, and Mao uh, is still, um, uh, uh, and the Cultural Revolution is still um, portrayed as, as a mistake. So I think Xi Jinping understands just how extraordinarily explosive um, you know, these issues can be, um, both for individuals and their interests within the party. But as I said earlier, if, if you think that uh, loss of faith in the party as being the only historical force in China that can put it where it needs to go, then being negative about things like the Qing or the war on Japan, that contradicts that narrative, right? Which means that um, if Xi Jinping believes that people who are historical nihilists are trying to overthrow the PRC by re 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 rewriting the history, including two people like you, um, then I think that helps explain why he, why he behaves in these particular ways. Well, that's the, I think there's a lot of implications here for, for the wider, you know, challenge of, of, of how to understand the rise of China. And, and as I mentioned earlier, you know, what looks like she's, you know, third term is coming up here at the party Congress. Um, and, and with considering that we're running out of time here, I wanted to pose, you know, a question with a few different uh, dynamics within it uh, to each of you, uh, just for some quick final thoughts. Um, and, and really, you, a lot of times you see in, in the commentary, especially, in, in that Xi Jinping is compared to Mao in terms of his power, his consolidation over the party, you know, that, that this is a, a turn away from collective leadership, et cetera. And I'm, I'm curious as to your re reactions of, of whether this is accurate, you know, in the case of Casey's project, for instance, you know, what, it, it, that there's a lot less uh, unity within the party as there may, may, may seem from the outside. Um, and then from the stance of history, is this a comparison that Xi Jinping is making himself? So I think we could probably start in, in just kind of the order of the presentation. So McCabe, uh, feel free to kind of you know, take that question and run with it a little bit. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I don't think, I, I, don't have any, I don't have any great insight into this. I think I might uh, defer to, to Joseph. Uh, who probably has more intelligent things to say, say, say on the matter. It doesn't really touch exactly on my, on my research. Um, yeah, I, I'll, I'll, I'll pass, to, pass to the others. Uh, thanks, uh, Emily, do you have any, any thoughts? I mean, a couple thoughts. So, I mean, I've heard, um, as you have many allegations that Xi Jinping is the most powerful leader since Mao and that he has kind of rejected the co more collective leadership model that Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao um, preferred. Um, I guess I'll speak just a tiny bit on um, the war of resistance against Japan again. Um, so under Mao, I mean, it was a very different narrative that like de-emphasized both the century of humiliation and the war of resistance against Japan, um, largely because, you know, the PRC is this like fledgling country and um, there's something in the scholarship called the victor narrative that is promoted instead versus under Xi Jinping, like the historiography is now totally different. The century of humiliation, war of resistance against Japan and this victim narrative is promoted a lot. So I see that as one major difference, at least in how, um, well, this isn't really speaking to Xi and Mao's like, um, you know, um, styles of ruling, but I mean, they interpret history quite, modern Chinese history quite differently. Casey? Um, I'm just, I guess, trying to think about how this uh, relates to my project. And I think I, I, I would just say that, you know, um, Xi Jinping, he, he, I think he has incredible sway over maritime policy decision-making now, much more than, um, previous leaders, arguably. Um, and it's clear that he, at least in the maritime realm, he, he sets the broad agenda. Um, but even so, I, I do think there's still considerable room for all of these subnational foreign policy actors to, to interpret it um, and to still, um, you know, pursue their, their more parochial interests. Um, but you know, that being said, I, I don't want to again minimize the role that she plays here either, because um, even if he's not some sort of a puppet master who who's orchestrating each and every move um, of, of all of China's maritime actors, he still shapes the incentive structure under which they operate, and I think he's done so in a way that's far more obvious than um, at least the previous two leaders. When it comes to Xi Jinping's views of Mao, of course, we can't know for sure. But if I had to guess, 
I think that he has a strong emotional connection to Mao. Mao is the one who saved his father from execution by other communists in 1935 is the person who uh, established the PRC. And I think he believes that rejecting Mao would be extraordinarily dangerous for party stability. But I also think that he thinks that the Cultural Revolution was an absolute disaster and, re and rejects um, those leftist policies. Uh, is he rejecting collective leadership? Um, I think that people have overstated how different um, he is from Deng. Uh, and Deng was an extraordinarily powerful leader and went through st stress tests of his leadership that Xi Jinping has not gone through. So uh, Deng Xiaoping forced through price reforms in 1988, even though most of the leadership opposed it. He forced a violent crackdown in 1989, even though most people opposed it. He forced a new policy of um, uh, reform and opening once again in 1992, even though he had no formal positions within the party at all. Uh, it's hard to imagine Xi Jinping kind of doing those kinds of things, but in any case, he hasn't fought those, fought, um, faced those tests yet. And when it comes to this idea of a core, the core came from the Deng era. Uh, Deng said to Jiang Zemin, um, when I am here, what I say goes, when you become the top leader, I want what you say to, be go, to, what you say to go. Uh, we are better than Western democracies because we have this ability with the core single leader to force through changes. That's exactly what Deng saw um, as the, as the, um, as the um, advantage of having a CCP system. This was not someone who was sort of chairman of the board of instead of oligarchs. I think this is also a false understanding of, of past elite party. Uh, party history. Um, Xi Jinping is different in the sense that he is the formal charge of everything and is micromanaging everything. Deng is different in that I think he had this revolutionary authority and prestige and status that Xi Jinping didn't have, but wasn't as involved in, in the sort of day to day. So that, that's how I would characterize those differences. Well, thank you all of you uh, for your excellent uh, presentations and a lively discussion of some really interesting and, and often overlooked considerations for, for the state of, of China today. Um, I just want to say thank you, uh, you know, McKay, Emily, Casey, Joseph, uh, this is great. Um, I really enjoyed it. I think it's a great presentations. Um, and to the audience, I just wanted to let you all know that the conference will break uh, for one day until it resumes again on Wednesday, February 16th at 10 a.m. Eastern time with a panel entitled China and its relations with developing countries in the global south, which will be moderated uh, by the Wilson Center's Jennifer Turner. Thank you. Have a good night.